So this is my last New Zealand vlog. And one of the most controversial topics about New Zealand farming is about how they manage grazing over winter. And I've tried to be as diplomatic as I can throughout my year here, but now let's get to the root of it. show you how to eat a sleep. <laughs> and these these sheep brought on it is you've got several different mobs knocking around but then the supplemental feed at this stage do they get any of grass? No, just all, just all grass. So when yeah. they're on sweets we do feed it at as well. Okay. Um, but they'll need that really right for the for the room yeah, yeah, yeah. Room Sweets are Sweets are a pretty safe feed, they're, yeah. they're almost complete. They, they take nitrogen uh, to most of them. Nitrogen, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. there you go, all the jargon. Adequate protein, but only just. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's why we feed them the bale, it's just, just a bit of a boost of protein there. Yeah, okay. Um, also, they, they just seem to enjoy it, they do better on it. We don't have a bit more fibre or something, I don't know. Yeah, 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 probably right. Yeah. Now, these remotes are brilliant. I okay. I don't know what unit I'm on, so I'll double check. This is one. Okay. Right, so that's on one. Stick that on there. That's reading 11,000 volts. And how hot is that? Touch it and see. <laughs> that's that's 11,000 volts on a powerful unit. So there we go. That's turned off. Oh. So in theory, yep. Now I can touch it. <laughs> it's always a bit nerve-wracking. We're in, the, we're in the Swede paddock, and yeah. we're just saying, so So this is your big bad winter, bad yep. winter grazing, the big bogeyman for a lot of people. You can, you can see just back over there, yeah. where it wasn't as wet. Yeah. So it's just this area where it's been quite wet. Wet when they've been grazing it? Yes. Yeah, and we've okay. got like eight, five mils of rain in four days. So oh, that's three right. and a half inches. This next break, that was in better weather. Better. So again, I know we've covered this before, but <clears throat> why bother with it? Like you've had to put this in, they'll graze it for a, a winter, you know, go in and put it into grass again, like reseed it. Why, why bother? Like why for the lay person? So the irony of, of it with all the controversy around winter grazing is that the main reason we do it yeah. is animal welfare. It sounds really weird, but the point we make is the ewes are pretty tough. The yeah. ewes have got a good jersey on their backs. We, we share the bellies. Yeah. So that they don't build up a whole lot of mud underneath. Yeah. Um, it's the lambs we worry about. The lambs in the first couple of days of life are the most susceptible animals on our farm. Okay. These and how ewes, do the Swedes help that? These ewes get fed really well. Yeah. The Swedes will yield roughly twice the amount of feed that our grass paddocks will protect here. Okay. So we'll get 15 tons in a bad year, 20 tons in a good year. Yeah. We're sort of 14, 15 this year. Um, our grass paddocks will do eight. Best case scenario would be 10 with a whole lot of urea. Yeah. So we do this, and what that allows us to do is to have a whole lot more grass on our lambing paddocks to lamb on. Yes. And the two biggest drivers of lamb survival are ewe condition and feed available. Ewe yeah. condition, obviously, to have a decent birth weight, feed available for the ewe to be able to milk quite well or to the best of her abilities. Um, if we do all grass wintering, and some people get away with it with like a dairy grazing system built in. Yeah. If you're half dairy grazing, your sheep will be wintered on grass all year, or winter, but the cows are then wintered on the crop on your farm. And we don't have that aspect to ours. We're 93% sheep. Mm. We've got the cattle on the feed pad. So no one seems to get away with it without winter cropping or cereal cropping to some degree. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Cereal cropping's the other that, one. That's a perennial livestock issue. You grow lots of grass in the summer, yes. spring and summer. Yep. Uh, and maybe in the autumn, and then you grow nothing over the winter. That's and it's problem. trying to match that, flex your stock numbers to what you have available. Yes. Or, like, this is the other get round, isn't it? You have the higher stock numbers, but you you grow this en you know, dense feed for them to carry them through the winter and yes. then maintain what you've got. So, and, and the argument that a lot of people make about destocking, running a lower stocking rate. Yeah. So you were here last spring. Yes. We didn't put any urea on last spring. Yes. 
You imagine if we had 15% less stock on the place. <laughs> we would have probably made four to 500 bales to sell. Yeah. Uh, we would have paid, by the time we actually, there was a bit of mould in that one's probably not uh, <laughs> Pick another one, pick another bit. Um, that bale wasn't the best, but you see there's yeah. clover and stuff in it. That yeah. was a sort of stalky paddock, yeah. there's nothing but stalk and clover. But yeah, we, um, we would have made that and we yeah. would have lost $20 for every bale that we sold. Yeah, so that doesn't work, and that's no. because you export a lot of fertility doing that. We yeah. like to run a closed system in that respect. The only thing we import onto the farm is fertilizer and rams, yeah. and the only thing we export, and the four day old calves, the only thing we export is meat and wool. Yeah, there's, by the way, just to interrupt, there's Sarah doing some work. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try and hide there. Sarah's, That's... Sarah's getting her fences set up for her triplets, we'll have a look at She's that. She's got to hide way. behind here while we're doing this. <laughs> so you're saying, oh, again, I'm not sure I got that previously, but this is, they, they got onto this break yesterday, did you say, or two uh, days ago? This morning, this break. This morning, okay, so, so this is like a fresh, you can see the, the very neat line. Yep. Um, so they'll, they'll, I'm expecting them to get two to three days. I mean, some of these Swedes are bloody massive. I mean, look these, at the size of that. These are not, compared to their normal yield. Um, these are the narrow row spacings. Yeah. That there to be the average. Really? Yep. Bloody hell, look at the size so of that. And you were saying again, like, because Swedes, just like a lot of brassicas, um, they're goitrogenic, so they, they, they basically interfere with iodine. Um, but you have given these girls a depidine, which is a one yes. brand of like a long acting injectable iodine. What so flexidine is the same thing, yes. basically, yeah. Yep. Um, so, so that should counter, because the, the issues, of course, you did in your auntie then, which you'll know, but. You know, I, lambs that are born to use that have low iodine status tend to be a bit slow and Oof, interferes right. with lots of stuff, right? Yep. Um, yep. Oh no, great. There's... Yeah, so, and then this is your last break in front of us here. And then, so, so they'll be on this for what, two or three days? Two, two to three days here. We don't want to be putting pressure on them this <coughs> winter. Um, last no. winter, we had like two hectares of Swedes left over, so for the last four or five yeah. days they're on it. I just pulled the fences down for two hectares of Swedes and said, have it girls, and they ate 20% of it. And then I had to deal with the rest of it with cultivation gear. Yeah, yeah, so so what do they get on grass after this, these girls? They'll be spread out after this on grass. Yeah, yeah, Just yeah. like those other early girls up there. Like it always amazes me how well sheep are able to eat turnips and Swedes yeah. and root crops when they've got teeth designed for grazing. But you can see here they sort of nibble, nibble away, but they get through it. And you'll see them back in the other break where they actually chisel them out of the ground. Yeah. The bigger the Swede is, that one there, so that. they get it eaten down so far and they get a hold of the edge of it and they actually want it pulling the whole thing out of the ground. They just work away at it and every time yeah. it breaks a root off. Yeah. And the big butts you don't see, but the little ones work on minimum 20% wastage. Yeah. 20% residual, shouldn't say wastage. Um, All gets ploughed back in. That's yeah. the regenerative side of it, of course, isn't yeah. it, Ben? Yeah, <laughs> we regenerative because we've been doing it for years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's awesome. No. That's actually getting a wee bit dirty. What is it? Sorry. Oh, you get your little. There's your wedge. Wipe the dirt off that and try that. Give it, give it a chance. Okay. Because it does taste horrible to start off. <laughs> it's actually. Is it a quiet taste? No, it's, it's not bad. It's, it's not quite bad. mild. Yeah. Quite often on a hungover morning when I was young, you'd come out and you just <laughs> cut a wedge. Chew on a sweet. Chew away because yeah. Yeah. Need some sustenance. Yeah. Well, there you go. That's South and Salad. Um, Still prefer potatoes myself. <laughs> now, Ben, I'm just seeing over here. I'm not sure we're going there next, but one of the most interesting things I think I've seen in your place is this wintering pad. Yeah. Um, that's for your, your trading cattle, isn't it? Yeah. I've uh, got to be very careful how I say this. Okay. No, no. We don't have to go over there. No, 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 no. We can, we can have a look at that by all means. Uh huh. I don't like wintering cattle on crop myself on this farm here. <laughs> that is very diplomatic, okay. I, I can't find a way to make it work that I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. I do see a lot of people around the place that do. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what they're doing differently, but we just struggled with it. We talk about over here, mm -hmm. we don't see the soupiness and we don't see the, the runoff. Yeah. Well, we did with cattle, okay. the R1s. Mm -hmm. But it's one thing that I was always... We did it because it was the cheapest way to do it. Yeah. And we did it because it was a very good way to do it. They do very well in on In terms briskets. of feed, yeah. yes. They do very well on brassica. I'd definitely say they did better on the brassica than they are in the feed pad. And there's another factor to it. We get all our regrassing done really early. 
Yeah, okay. These cattle weren't coming off the off the crop until early October. Which is too late for you, and, isn't it? Well, it's not that that's too late. It's that they'd be on half of the year in front of us, maybe three yeah. quarters of the year in front of us. And yeah. the whole rest of the paddock we wouldn't sow out because sowing paddocks and stages is annoying. But we'd often not get their paddocks sown out until November. Okay. And if it gets dry, that's dangerous because that's when your grass is going to have to be re-sown in February, March. So, lots of factors to it. But the gist of it is that I'm not a big fan of cattle on crop. That's a very long, you've, you've taken your time <laughs> to be very diplomatic there about on this farm, in your situation, what I'm, that's great. So, so that's your solution, is it? Yeah, what I'm trying to say is don't take this as cattle shouldn't be on crop because that's no. not what I'm saying. No, no, it's, <laughs> take more. Yeah, um, but anyway, we'll go and have a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're up at the up the the, the Dooley feed pad or, or wintering pad, uh, and you see you've got this fantastic. Are these are these be macro carpa. Most of them are macro carpa. There's a couple like, of pines. They're actually incredible trees. They're massive. One of them somewhere is a pine tree here. Um, further up anyway. And so this is like th uh, two sides. You see like the row here. There's a, there's a back row just back there, and then it, it's almost like a little plateau, isn't it, Ben? Yeah. So, yeah. These trees are like 170 odd years old. Yeah. Where's the Serious. Pine tree? One of them is a pine tree. <laughs> And so, and so these are your R1, so <laughs> rising one year olds. They'll be one, one year old now. Near, yeah, basically one year old now. We're due to get the new calves any day now. Dairy cross beef. Yep. Um, obviously, we did have quite a tough summer this yeah. last summer, so they're not, they're not the best they could be. No. Um, but this is, yeah, so there's one in here. Yeah. That's got a yellow tag in his ear. Yes. And he is the reason that that's there. <laughs> when we were ringing them, I could only find one nut. Ah, oh, he's a rig. Well, no, I, I'm pretty sure he only had one nut. There they go, they love the brush. Look at that. They love the brush. Pretty sure he only had one nut, but I couldn't find it and I just couldn't be sure, so we've got heathers and stairs. Okay. There are a couple of stairs in there, but they're not him. So not I'm him, not okay. Them. Um, yeah, so if it wasn't for that, they'd have this one big area. Yeah. And they probably wouldn't have made the mud on the other side of the trees and they'd be more inclined to camp over there. Yeah. But just the way it is. Had a lot of east lilies this year too, which means, yeah, the. This side of the trees is a bit wetter than it would normally be. Yeah. Normally but it's really muddy on that side. Yeah. And then on the other side of the trees is dry, just the way the, the rain blows in. Yeah. We were just having a conversation before it rolling, and we we're talking about, you know, what's too wet for cattle, you know, because yeah. you can have indoors or sheds can be pretty wet. Look at this soil here. I'm presuming this is hot, so I'm not going to get too close uh, to it. Not right now. Just All right, okay. Double check that. <laughs> just turn it back. Perfect, right, it's not hot. But is it like this? It's fine. This is great for them. This, this area, obviously, uh, uh, that. Like over by the feeder for the heifers, it's 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 reasonably wet, um, and then you know perhaps in the middle it's it's wetter, but they have what's important is that these animals have a um, nice dry area all along here in the, in the lee of these trees, a bit wetter there, but like up here, there's a nice nice dry area, and just before we came along and disturbed them, uh, the heifers were sitting down nicely. Some were eating, and some were sort of sat. Uh, chewing their cud. They're all chewing standing here. All chewing standing there. It's just because we've rucked them up a bit. But you know, they, were, they had a nice dry area to sit down and ruminate. And that's all that cattle really want to do. They want to eat and they want to ruminate and then go to sleep. Uh, and then the boys were just hooning around being boys. Uh, just, just, uh, yep. Which is a really typical, <laughs> I was just saying to Ben, it's actually play. I know it sounds really sort of frivolous, but sick, unhappy animals do not play. You know, that's one of the best things about lambs. Yep. When you get those, um, you know, when they the use a feeding, the gangs of lambs, yes. and that, you, you know, all those lambs in that gang are thriving. We, we've we just mentioned there on this farm, you don't feel that like crop wintering them on crop works for you, which I think right. every yeah. farm's so different, every yeah. farmer's so different. Um, so this is this is your alternative, and it's almost like its own open air shed. Yes. You know, and I think it's quite a, quite a commanding spot on the hill. Um, so, but it's because it's a plateau, it's not a slope, right? It's perfectly flat up here, really, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So there's no risk of runoff. Um, and this, this is this is probably as wet as it'll be all winter as well, won't it? Because it, you've had, like you said before, a lot half a meter of yeah, rain. Yeah, just just short half a meter of rain. This is only the second year we've been doing this with yeah. the calves, and I would like to 
put a whole lot of bark chip up here. Okay. Um, like get three or four truck and trailer loads in. It's not that expensive and just do it. Yeah. The problem is the last two years have been our first two years in business and we haven't, yeah. Had a tax bill to pay? <laughs> no, well, no, we had little ones. We had little ones, oh, yeah. but, but not but enough to, to get away with that. So no, no, no. just a couple of quite... So that might be a future, a future tweak perhaps yes, but it's the old story you've got to be in the black to be uh, well they say green but let's say to be it's, sustainable it's a luxury yeah yeah it's, yeah. A, it's a luxury the cattle would really enjoy yeah and we will get there one day it's just one of those things that you've actually got to make the money to be able to do that sort of stuff so true yeah and and there aren't any sheds in this farm are there apart from the wool shed no no no, no sheds that would be suitable for these cattle no no, no, no. nothing at all um, and do you think these guys, so, so you've got these steers and these heifers, they're, they're one year old now. Do you think they put on any weight over the winter or are you just yes, sort of storing them? They absolutely do put on weight, but look, they don't gain condition. They just keep no. growing. They can put on frame maybe. Yes, yep, yeah, exactly. Um, so I like, would put them on at say a 250 kilo yeah. average and take them off at a 350 yeah. maybe. Yeah. Um, yeah, and they do seem to enjoy those brushes too. Oh, definitely. So they've got, yeah, <laughs> they've got one each. That was, that was Sarah's contribution. That's why this fence had to go here. Yeah. She said they have to have a brush each. <laughs> so, yeah. And to be fair, last year I never saw them use them. She reckoned she did. And I'm going to have to believe her now because they, they do. Use they, them all the time. There's one just actually, over there just about to have a good scratch. Yeah, well that one hasn't worn as much, but this one's worn like two or three inches off the bristles. Oh, the boys and maybe the grooming. Yeah. You know, it's such a sensitive topic, like we say, sensitive live topic, wintering, yeah. especially winter of cattle. And i think we've got to be mindful of that it's, it's got to be sustainable for everyone it does um there's no perfect system um and and look you can go the uk way of throwing up a lot of expensive steel um and and that might work some places it maybe might. for dairy cows who who you know they <clears throat> let's face it probably generate more income the the gist of it is if we had to put a shit up to winter cattle we wouldn't be wondering cattle. and and you know yeah. what some people would say fine yeah, yeah absolutely, absolutely. You know, that, that's the long and short to, of it to be fair if we were told we had to put a shit up to do it we'd say fine too and we just yeah. wouldn't do it but it comes back then you end up having too much grass in the summer poor quality yep. that impacts your yep. sheep it's 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 way more complex than it, yeah the than systems, one single issue the systems are very very complicated and yeah. they all sort of have to fit together in a certain way yeah what well, if you were to send those away to wintering on crop i know people don't really do that with the beefies but what do you think that would cost you um so per so week figures? I think, I think the dairy grazing rate for them today would be close to $10 a head a week. $10, and how many have you got in there? There's 50, so, so 500, 500 bucks a week. week. So then... they're going to be in this feed pad for, last year was like 21 weeks. Because of the way the season works, they went in yeah. there mid-April. Yeah. This year they didn't actually get in here till um, early June. So you're talking about 10, 11 grand? So our profit margin on those would be maybe 15. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> term, and that includes the baleage here to be fair. Yes. Um, so I guess you wouldn't have that expense, but that's not huge. Um, yeah. So it would it would basically get up all the profit. Of it. And just like that, that is the last New Zealand vlog, at least for now. Thanks again to Ben and Sarah for having me and letting us lift the lid on their winter setup. Some farmers are understandably a bit defensive on the topic. Now, Ben and I had the rest of the morning looking at some ewe lambs on Swedes as well. Plus, we made a final trip to the paddock of Maisie put in last year to see how his Moata ryegrass was doing. Romping, as it turns out. It turns out we were talking for so long, the mic couldn't keep up. So if you're wondering why or how on earth you'd grow maize to graze sheep on, there'll be a link to his and my videos on just that in the video description. Of course, that means the next vlogs will be coming to you live and direct back from Northumberland in the UK. I'll have to find out what's been going on over my year away and there should be plenty to catch up on. Stay tuned for those videos. Of course, if you've made it this far and you're not already subscribed, you're not gonna want to miss them. So click that button, ring the little bell next to it. That means you won't miss any and it'll keep me happy too. Until next time. Take that off. Right. It's my, nearly my last New Zealand video. One of the most controversial things about New Zealand farming is the winter grazing practices. Let's get, no, what I'm gonna say, do it again, two secs, two, take two. Well, I, need, I need to find a small enough Swede that I can bite into it, hang on. Where have we got a nice little? Have you held your camera for a minute? Oh yeah, this is Hollywood. It's absolutely. Uh, actually... ben, Ben's just preparing me my Swede here.